Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Let me thank you for being here and being here on this Sunday morning to come into the house of the Lord and to worship. He's given us a beautiful, beautiful morning to do that. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we want to thank you for coming and being a part of our uh, service today. It's great to have you. If there's anything that you need or anything that we can answer any questions to, we'll be glad to do that. So we just appreciate you coming in. If you would, just remember the nominating team this year. Uh, we're still in the process of, of filling positions and, and things like that. Uh, if you're interested in the sound team, the multimedia team, Walker Talker, Children's Church, please let us know uh, so that we can get you on that schedule uh, and so that we can... Um, get it all together so we can bring it to the church however we're going to do that this year uh, to vote on it so uh, just continue to pray about that and continue to ask the Lord where he would want you to serve uh, Adam and Katie continue to remember them as they are heading down for their honeymoon this week uh, just ask that the Lord would protect them and watch over them uh, had a great time yesterday as the the wedding and everything so just remember uh, them as uh, they start their new journey on life if you would just make a note that Jake and Hope's shower is actually on August 9th and it's not on August 8th it's in the bulletin as uh, August 8th that that's going to be from 3 to 5 uh, August 9th is it 2 to 4 so it's 2 to 4 for those of you on Facebook just it's two to four, so um, if you would just mark that on your calendar, and we want to wish uh, Cora Mae Rollins a happy birthday today. So if you see Cora Mae or you know uh, you might see her, just wish her a happy birthday. I know that the Lord will bless you on that. As I was reading this week and I was getting prepared for what the Lord has laid on my heart uh, to bring this morning, I went to Psalm 119, and it's out of 189, or out of verse 89, I'm sorry. And the psalmist says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Isn't that a sweet promise? You know what? His word is settled in heaven. He's the same yesterday as he is today, as he will be tomorrow. Uh, and he, he goes on and he says, your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You have established the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances. It's because of his word, his word, that all things are standing, that we're here existing, uh, that it's, it's because of his truth. Not ours, but his. Isn't that amazing to understand that he loves us enough to give us guidelines and standards to go by? so that we know what we need to be doing as his people. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we can come before your throne of grace this morning. As we even just think about that, Lord, we can see the angels ministering to you, singing holy, holy, holy. We can see the rainbows, the lightning, the thunder. Lord, just as your word explains it, out of Isaiah 6 and out of Revelation 4 and 7, Father, we just thank you that we have access to that throne room. And Lord, we come on bid to knee this morning asking you to shove everything out of our minds and hearts this morning. Father, we come confessing our sins before you. Father, we know that some way, somehow we have fallen short. And Father, we just come and we just ask that you would just forgive us. Just give us that pure heart and that pure mind that we can hear your word this morning. The truthfulness of it. What we have to look forward to, Lord. We just thank you that each one that is here and who are joining us via social media, Lord. We thank you that they're here with us. That as the church, Lord, we are gathered together to be able to worship you in song and in your word. So Father, we just ask that as we go through this next hour, that Lord, you would just be glorified. For Lord, it's not what we can get out of the service. It's not what 
we want. But Lord, it's preparing our hearts to give you the worship that you're so worthy of. That Lord, we're bringing ourselves up on the altar, sacrificing ourselves, our selfishness, to serve a living God who loves us, who's merciful and kind, whose grace extends uh, way, way more than we can ever see. So Father, as we get ready to come and sing, we just ask that as your ear is bent over towards your children, that Father, you would be pleased. You would be pleased and honored and glorified in all that's said and done in this service today. For it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Would all stand with me and join with me and let's glorify his name this morning. house to worship him you see if you come here to expect something for you you came for the wrong reason you came for the wrong reason because we're here and our heart should have been prepared already to give it to the Lord that's why we're here that's why we come we worship him it's not about us it's all about him. Has nothing to do with us. Has to do all without with him. Now the culture in which we live in don't want to hear that. A lot of churches and a lot of Christians that come to church don't want to hear that. But that's God's biblical view. He is worthy to be praised. He is the number one. He is the audience 
of one. So I trust that you've prepared your hearts this morning to hear the word in which he has whispered to me over these past 19 weeks. How long we've been in here since March 22nd we've been in this series answering these questions that we have answered. This morning we're going to be out of Revelation chapter 21, 1 through 8. In the Los Angeles Times in October 24th, 2003, a Barna poll indicated that 76% of Americans believed in heaven, 71% believed in hell. Of those who believed in heaven, 50% believe you can get there without accepting Jesus Christ. That was 17 years ago. It can only be worse today in the culture in which we live in, in this relevant culture. That may be true for you. It's not true for me. You know what? I can get to heaven, however, in my good works, I can give it all the money that I need to give. I don't have to believe in accepting Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Isn't that sad? You see, people say, well, you know what, if, if there's a God of this world, if, if, if he's really true and he really loves it, then why is all this suffering is in this world? There's no hope. You see, folks, it's not a matter of if God can bring this all to the close. It's a matter of when. You see, history is not circular. History is linear, beginning and an end and at some point in time he's going to bring this world as we know it to an end there is hope in this suffering world I want you to know that this morning there's hope in this suffering world no matter what makes your view dim no matter what may be going into your life no matter what sickness or death may be there no matter what persecution you may be going through on a daily life no matter what stress or worry or anxiety or depression that you have being overwhelmed. There's hope in this suffering world. There's a promise which we as Christians need to hold on to and look forward to. I, I love that psalm. I love that psalm where it says, hey, you know what? Your word's settled in heaven. I have a promise. I have a promise that Jesus never changes even though things in our life change Jesus never changes he's always the same and his word is always the same whether people want to believe that or not whether the outside culture says no that's not for me or you know what there's no moral standards Jesus says there are he's the truth you see truth is a person in Jesus Christ he says I'm the way the truth and the life truth is a person and that person has given us promises. And it's up to you and me to believe and stand upon those promises, right? Isn't that what, this, isn't that what the song says? We're standing on the promises of God. But do we really? When it comes down to it, do we really stand on the promises of God? There's a promise we need to look forward to and hold on to. One day that promise that our, of our Lord will come to fruition, that he's going to end all of this. One day the evil in the world will be defeated. There will be a place where all will be right and beautiful. Ah, oh, won't that be a great day when we experience that? It'll be a place where the creator and the designer of this whole universe and life will dwell among his people. You know, we got this concept of heaven wrong. You understand that, right? We got this concept of heaven wrong because we're wanting to go to heaven with God. We want to be in heaven with God. We're, we want to live in heaven with God. But you know what? One day, heaven is not going to be up there. Heaven's going to be on earth and God is going to dwell with us. Oh, won't that be a great day, folks? He's coming to dwell with his people once again. And we're going to live in eternity with him. I want you to recall the most beautiful place you have seen in your lifetime. The most beautiful place. Just put it in your memory. It'll just be a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like. 
You know what? I've been to a lot of beautiful places, and I'm just like, I've been to creek sides in the mountain with beautiful views, and I'm just like, Lord, just let me sit here for the rest of my life. I'll be good. Heaven will be just as beautiful, if not more. There won't be any smog. There's not going to be any filthiness. No pollution of any kind. I want you to think about it. You've been in the mountains. Maybe in the early morning or maybe in the early afternoon. And a rain shower has come or it's coming. And you can smell the pureness of that rain. And that rain comes and it washes, washes everything out. And it's just a pure, sweet smelling aroma of purity and cleanness. It'll smell with all different aromas of sweetness. You know what? Maybe you have a, 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 a favorite flower or bush or, or whatever. You know, people like to stick their noses in flowers and smell, right? But you know what? Heaven will smell like that, but it'll smell oh so much better. And it'll be oh so much more beautiful. This morning as we continue in our series, Behold, He Comes with the Clouds. I want us and allow ourselves to go to heaven in our minds and our spirits. That's where I want you to be this morning. Of what God's word talks about. Heaven. That's where we need to focus this morning. We need to allow the Holy Spirit to bring a glimpse of what heaven's going to be like. Something that we look forward to. You know what? There's so many people in this world that want to hold on to this world and hold on to everything in it. And they don't want to let go of it. But we've got so much more to look forward to. So much more to look forward to than this old world. Yeah, we're supposed to enjoy it. There's no doubt about that. And be the light and the salt. We'll talk a little bit about that. But you know what? We need to let loose of this world. To give us hope in the world which seems so topsy-turvy today. Do you see it in it? You know what? This world today is so topsy-turvy. It's confused. It's, it's angry. We need to catch a glimpse of what it's going to be like for eternity. And we need to smile. We need to let go of all this trash that blocks our way, that blocks our vision, that, that Satan puts in front of us as 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4. He blinds us. Of, put all this trash away and get a glimpse of what's in store for us. Wouldn't our lives be a lot better? Wouldn't our lives be a lot different if we woke up every morning and said, Oh my goodness, what I've got waiting on me is nothing like what I'm living in right now. It would bring a smile to our faces and it would be a longing in our hearts for that day. Let me ask you something. Do you long for that day? Folks, I long for that day. You say, Chris, you're, you're relatively not. I long for that day. I long for that day when I can be there. It's like I told them this morning. You know what? If God took me right now behind this pulpit, I would be good. I've told Laura and Jake and everybody, don't grieve over me. Have a celebration. Don't grieve over me. Don't, don't, don't say, oh, and, and put life on hold. Celebrate because you know what? I know. She knows. Jake knows. My family knows that we'll all be reunited once again. We've systematically studied where we're at to this point of history and what will happen in the future. You know what? We started in 2 Timothy, I think it was 3, may have been 1 Timothy 4, about the difficult days that we're in. We're not in the last days. We're not, we're, we're not in this tribulation period or the day of the Lord. We're in the difficult days Paul talks about. 
That's where we're at now. And, and, and then we move to the responsibility of the churches out of Revelation 2 and 3 and, and what our responsibility are, is during these days. You know what? We have a responsibility as a church during these difficult days to live the life of Christians, to tell others about the hope in which we have in our lives, in telling people who don't think there's any hope, in telling people who are angry, in telling people who are bitter, in telling people who have all this trash in their life that there is hope... And and there's light in this world, and his name is Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing in a time like we've experienced in the last three months. We're not supposed to get caught up in all this cultural stuff. We're supposed to be the church. You don't think John was persecuted? He was all caught up in the cultural stuff. In fact, he was persecuted, put on an island. But what was his focus? It was God. It was God. He didn't care about all the other junk that was going on. He wanted to tell people about Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So that's the responsibilities of the church. Then we're not supposed to be ashamed of the gospel like we talked about in Romans 1, 14 through 17. That you know what? We should be telling everybody that we can that the world is going to come to an end and that one day they're, they're either going to be in a in a great place called heaven or they're going to be tormentedly in agony in hell. You know what? I've been at bedsides with families. And they're all crying and they're all in agony and there's grief and sorrow and, and, and someone would ask, I asked someone, I said, you know, do they know Jesus Christ as their Savior? I don't know. That's between, I have no idea. I said, have you ever asked them? Oh, no, we wouldn't do that. Why not? I said, so you're going to sit here for however long wondering if your loved one is going to be in heaven or not. Yeah, I mean, we're not going to ask him. You know, I'd go in and I would sit there with them if they were, they could communicate, and I'd ask them. You know what? What do you have to lose? I mean, that sounds bad, but what do you have to lose? And, and why would you be ashamed or scared to share the gospel with someone that's on their dying bed and saying, hey, do you know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior? It's a really easy answer. It's either a yes or a no. You know what? If it's a yes, then well, guess what? Oh, man, I'm going to see them again. If it's a no, you share the gospel with them. And if they choose to accept the gospel, then you rejoice. If they choose not to, then you tell and you minister to the family and tell them the truth and how they can have comfort and everything. You see, we're ashamed to do that. I've, I've talked to many people about their aunts and uncles and friends. and their, are, Were they a Christian? I don't know. I never asked them. Why not? Why don't we ask them? It's a real simple question to clear up, isn't it? Because we're afraid. We're not supposed to be ashamed. Yep, I believe in the rapture of the church. One day, he's going to come with the clouds. And out of 1 Thessalonians 4, it says he's coming with the clouds and we're going to meet him in the air so his foot never touches on the earth. Right? So it's not his second coming. It's the rapture of church. I believe in the rapture of the church. Waiting for that trumpet sound. Why that's going on, there's going to be a seven-year tribulation period in which... The rise of the Antichrist is coming. There's going to be a one world government. There's going to be Armageddon. And then Christ is going to set up his thousand year reign. He's going to sit on his throne. There's going to be peace for a thousand years with Jesus Christ on his throne running everything. And then that old devil has to come loose again just for a short time. And he's going to come. And the Bible says what? Like the sands of the seashore. People are going to line up with the devil. Can you? I, that blows my mind. After a thousand years of peace, blows my mind. But you see, that's the relative world that we live in. That's the world in which the culture says, that's your truth, that's not my truth. And you know what? I don't want to really, I don't believe that Jesus is really that king or that lion or that lamb or whoever he is. I'm going to line myself up over here with the culture and they're all going to die and then they're going to spend eternity in hell. Then there's that final war where God just, or Jesus says, it's over through his word. 
He's going to do away with everything, the great, great white throne judgment we spoke of last week where the unbelievers are all going to be resurrected, give an account, and then he's going to say, depart from me, you accursed ones. The eternal state of hell is first. And this morning I want to talk about the eternal state of heaven. This is where we're going to camp out this week and next. We're going to catch a glimpse of, of, of what heaven's like. John's trying to express it, but with God it's hard to express in some feelings with this. It's hard to express. John did the best he could to try to express what heaven was all about, and he did his best to try to describe it. The little girl was taking an evening walk with her father, and she looked up at the stars and exclaimed wonderfully, she said, oh, Daddy, if the wrong side of heaven is so beautiful, what must the right side be? You ever think about that? Have you ever just laid out underneath the stars and, and, and there's no light and you just look up and, and you see the designer, the creator of this universe. He's hung every one of them. He knows everyone by name. He knows when they go out. He knows when they come into existence. And how beautiful it is. Why wouldn't the other side be even more beautiful than that? Out of a child's mouth. So let's examine some truths of this sermon that I entitled, Finally Heaven. Because that's where we've been. It's where we've come from. Finally Heaven. Let's look in Revelation 21. We're going to start in verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. That word sea literally means salt water. Okay? It means that there will not be an ocean. There will not be a sea. That, that the land will be coming together. That doesn't mean that there might not be fresh water, but it means that the sea will be gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. Isn't that a sweet promise right there? If you don't realize that's a promise, Jesus makes that statement continuously all the way through the book of Revelation. That is a promise. Blessed are those who believe these are faithful and true trustworthy that you know what this is what truth is about my word is the truth this is what's going to happen what a promise when we grab a hold of that and when we realize that in our lives then he said to me it is done if you want to put there it's the same word it is finished that jesus used on the cross i am the alpha and the omega the beginning and the end i will give to one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit these things. I will be his God and he will be my son or daughter. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the immoral persons, the sorcerers, the idolaters, all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Isn't it amazing how God allows us the glimpse and then he comes back to reality in the culture in which we live in and says, I'm just telling you, these people aren't going. Especially in a culture in which it says, hey, everybody's going, or, you know, those who don't believe are going to be disintegrated and no more and everything. But God's word continuously tells us and warns those who are unbelievers what is going to happen. So let's examine these truths. Number one. Uh, what I want us to see is there's a new heaven and a new earth. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. God promises us in his word that he is going to make things new. This heaven and this earth, as we know it, will be no more. It was melted away. 
at the great white throne. That's what his word says. It's not going to be renewed. It's going to be recreated. God promises that, us that. How do we know that? Isaiah 65, 17 says, Behold, I create a new heaven and a new earth, and all the former things shall not be remembered. Nothing will be remembered of this past life. Everything will be new. Isaiah 66, 22 says, The new heavens and the new earth will endure before the Lord. Although all through the Old Testament, God promises to make things new. That there will be newness and purity of all things. Why is that? It's because this old earth in its sinfulness has started to decay the first time that sin came into this world. And it continues to decay even now. Just like we do. 2 Peter 3.10 says this, But the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the elements will be, will be destroyed with intense heat. He's going to do it with heat, not the flood. He's already promised us that he's not going to flood this anymore because we got the covenant of the rainbow, right? And earth and its works will be burned up. When will that happen? Go back a few verses in 11 through 15, and you'll see when it happens. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what sort of people ought to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God? That's Peter saying that's what we should be. We should be looking in holiness and in our conduct, and people should be looking at us, and, and, and we should be pointing them to the Lord. Because of which the heavens will be destroyed by, and the elements will melt with intense heat. But according to his promise... We are looking what? For new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Can you, can you even think about that today? Have you even thought about that? that? When God creates the new heaven and the new earth and we're up on it, it will be nothing like today. All, all the anger, all the confusion, all the bitterness, everything that gets in our way of worshiping God, as well as everything in which those people that don't want anything to do with God will be gone. And we'll live life the way it's supposed to be lived. Isn't that a sweet promise, folks? Isn't that a sweet promise? Why is God going to do away with the old heaven and the old earth? Because he's holy and righteous and sin cannot be in his presence. Roman 8, 18 through 22 says, For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory. I want you to understand something this morning. And this is something that he's laid on my heart this morning. What is it that is getting in your way? What type of bitterness? What type of anger? What type of hurt? What type of feeling or emotion is getting in your way on this old earth to where you cannot see the glory that's to come? Because that's what it's all about. Nothing in this earth can compare for the glory that's coming with the new heaven and the new earth. Man, don't that get you pumped? It ought to. You see, because we worry about all this other junk down here. Yeah, you know what, well, I'm human. Yeah, it is. But you know what? Jesus gives us promises. He gives us guidance in his word how to get over all that. When was the last time you thought about heaven? No, I mean seriously. We ought to get up every morning and think about, you know what, this whole place, I've got this eternal place. It, new heavens, new earth, we're going to be there. It's not going to have any of this nastiness in it, you know, or, or hurt or whatever it is. But Paul goes on and he says, for we know the whole creation groans and suffers. You see, it's not just us, it's the whole creation that groans and suffers. It's the whole world. It's the world itself. Why? Because it knows as well as we do there's a, there's a new world coming. The old heaven and the old earth started to decay after sin. Now, how do I know that? It's called the second law of thermodynamics. You ever heard of it? Second law of thermodynamics. What it says is this. It tells us that the universe is running out of energy each and every day. You see, but God's going to create this new heaven and this new earth where it will never decay, where it will never run out of energy. That's that Isaiah 41 promise, I think it is, where we're always in to have our strength, where we're, we're young and we can bound like the deer.
I want you to note one thing, that heaven and earth will be one. Did you see that? Then I saw the new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the uh, first earth passed away and there was no longer a sea. And the holy city, Jerusalem, came down out of heaven. So what happens? Creates a new earth. Heaven's up here. The new Jerusalem is suspended evidently during this time. And what does God do? He brings heaven down to earth with the new Jerusalem. We'll talk about that next week. Earth and heaven is one. What will it be like? What will it be like? Well, I think we've got a good description of it in Genesis 1 and 2. I think we've got a good description of what the new earth and the new heaven is going to look like out of Genesis 1 and 2. I think that we've got a good description out of it in the Gospels of, that, that tells us that, you know what, we're not all going to be floating up on clouds with playing harps and singing. But there's work to be done up there. We're going to be at work. We're not just going to be laying around eating grapes. He's got work for us to do. We're going to glorify him. We're going to worship him. But we're going to be put in charge of things, right? That's what his word says. For those who have faithfully been put in charge of this, a few things, you will be put in charge of more. That doesn't mean just down here. It means up there too. We're going to have things to do. Just like Adam and Eve tended the garden. We'll tend to the heavens. Secondly, God will dwell among us. God will dwell among us. Out of verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne. Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. You know what? Here's the, here's the question. Who's God? Man, that'll blow your mind if you want to think about that. Don't ever think about that before you go to sleep, because you'll never sleep that night. Because you'll sit there and you'll think, who is God? And then all of a sudden, it'll be 5 o'clock next morning. It's God the Father, it's God the Son, and it's God the Holy Spirit. We'll experience his kindness, his love, his compassion, his grace firsthand. We'll see him face to face. Just as God walked with, in the garden with Adam and Eve, just as he walked from the, for, before the nations in the cloud and the pillar of fire, just as he came into the tabernacle that Solomon built for him, just as he came in the tabernacle of the flesh in Jesus Christ, just as he indwells his children right now, he will be among us for all eternity. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said to him, if anyone loves me, he will what? Keep my word. Isn't his word beautiful? You see, your truth is settled in heaven. Keep my word. It's true. If you true, if it's if you keep my word, then what? We will make our abode in you, he says. We will make our abode, our home place, in you. Isn't that a beautiful picture? You know what? So many people don't want to believe the word of God. So many people want to make up their own truth. So many people want to say, no, I don't believe it. Some of it's true, part of it. No, Jesus throughout his teaching talks about his word. John 17, 17. Sanctify them in your, what? Truth. Your truth is your word. Jesus is the word of God. He is the logos. He's the one who spoke into creation. He's the one who created you and me. He's the one who said, I am going to come and I am going to die on a cross. I am going to be buried and then I'm going to be raised. And he did it. He's true. The first three quarters of the Bible have been fulfilled. The last quarter is we're awaiting it for it to be fulfilled. But it's going to be because he's true. 2 Corinthians 2.16 says, Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore, come out from the midst and be separated. What does that mean? It means, hey, you know what? You are in the world, but you don't need to be of it. Come out and be holy. Come out and be pure. Come out and let people see the light and the salt that you're supposed to be. Don't be a part of the culture in which we're living in. But be holy and separate and let them come to you. 
We're not supposed to go hiding in a closet. We're supposed to be out among people and talking to them and, and, and telling them about who he is and, and why he's come. But we're not supposed to be drug in to the dregs of the culture. We're not. Therefore come out of their midst and be separated, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean. That's his word, right? His word is truth, so you know what? We don't need to be involved in unclean things. And I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. He's going to dwell with us. You know what? He's preparing us now to get rid of all that junk in our lives so that we can spend eternity with him. So why don't we get rid of it now so that we know what is waiting for us that day. Thirdly, the, the first thing shall come to pass. Or the, the first things pass away. And he'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. We've shed many a tear in our lifetime, haven't we? We came into this world crying, right? We came out of the womb and we started crying. We've had needs as babies. We've shed many a tear in our lifetime for the wayward sons and the daughters. We've shed many a tear in suffering, watching as one a loved one battles a disease. Maybe, uh, they've, been, maybe they've been handicapped and, and we watch them suffer and, and, and walking in and, 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 and we cry and, and, and our hearts are just tender about that. We end our lives crying, right? When, when, when someone we love dies, we, we cry. The loss of loved ones, the sorrow and grief. You see, really and truly, when you think about it from the beginning of it to the end of our lives, there's a lot of crying we do in there. Our spirit cries out. We cry. It's God's way of healing. But you know what? One day we won't have to worry about that. No more crying. Why? Because sin will be gone. The curse of man's disobedience will be no more. Separation from God will be no more. Separation of a loved one will be no more. You know what? I've got aunts and uncles. I've got grandparents. And my mom's there. I've got friends that have died and are gone. But one day, folks, I know I'm going to see them. Why? Because not only did I ask them, but because they told me, you know what? I'll see you on the other side, Chris. We'll be good. We'll live eternity. We'll live in eternity. Let me just show you something. Let me give you an illustration about eternity. You see, we think this life that we're living in is so long, but it's usually, what, 70, 80, maybe 90 years. The edge of this paper represents our years on earth. Right there. The edge of that paper. How long we live on earth. Eternity is all this other space around us plus everything outside. Think about it. And we hold on to so much junk on this side. Knowing what's going to happen. Knowing that we have this promise. See, all sin is done within heaven. No mourning, no death, no crying, no pain. No more earth's groaning. All things are new. Fourth, why should we believe it? Verse 5. He said, what, well, right, for these words are faithful and true. Then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without any cost. You see, it was Jesus' purpose. He came to die for the world's sins. He came to appease God's wrath on mankind. Christ came on to take the sins of man, yours and mine. So that man could live in the way that he was created for. With a relationship with God. He says it's done in verse 6. Jesus said what? It's finished. Y'all ever paid anything off? Car, house, some type of debt. What do they do with it? 
It's either they either put cancel on it, they say payment in full, whatever it may be. That's what Jesus did for us. He stamped it in red. All is appeased. The devil is beaten. Death is overcome. Friends, when we understand about the gospel and when we don't take the gospel for granted, which this world does, which this church age does, this church age takes the gospel for granted and, and we get immune to it. And we don't think anything about it, but it cost our Savior his life for us. It cost him his blood for us to put that cancel. First Corinthians fifteen twenty six said the last enemy is abolished death. There's no more death, no more pain, no more crying. He said, I'll give to those who are thirsty. What is your soul thirsting for this morning? Is it for all the junk? Is it, are you living to be bitter or angry? Are you living to get somebody back or pay somebody back? Or are you living for more junk in your life? Are you living for more material stuff? Because that's not what he's talking about. He's saying, you know what? That's what you're trying to fill the void space in. But I'm going to give you some living water. In which when you come to me and you trust in me and what I've done on the cross for you, I'm going to give you a drink of water that lasts for eternity. You know, we think that old Gatorade will quench our thirst. The only thing that's going to quench this world and this culture's thirst is Jesus Christ. What are you looking for this morning? Who are you looking for this morning? How are you looking for it? You see, those are questions we have to ask. For those who overcome, those who persevere, those who have faith, guess what? A better country's waiting. A better country. This is not our home, folks. We're just passing through. I've got a better country that's waiting for me. In the new heaven and the new earth where I'll be there for eternity with all my friends and brothers and sisters in Christ and being happy and, and don't have to worry about this place. What if, we, what if we choose not to believe? Let, let, let's talk about that. Verse 8. What's he say? But for the cowardly. What do you, what is it? That's the one who runs away. That's the one who's fearful. No, I'm not going to follow. No, uh -uh. I don't care about Jesus. I don't care about God. That's the one he's talking about. How about the unbelieving? That one that's not trustworthy. Those who lack truth in their life, who, who, who could care less about anything that God has done, could care less about God, could care less about anything His Word says. How about the abominable? That means to abhor and detest anything to do with God. Murderers. Unlawful killings. Immoral people. Guess what that means? It, that, that, anytime you see that immoral people or immorality in the New Testament, it means porneia. It means pornography. It means sexual sins. Anybody that, that, that has sexual sins as uh, an idol in their life and, and, and doesn't even try to, but allows that to rule their life. How about sorceries or sorcerers? Guess what that word means? It means pharmaceutical in the Greek. Why is it? Because the pharmaceuticals that the sorcerers use to mix up, to call the spirits, to give to people, whatever it may be, that's how we got our term pharmaceuticals. From the occult. Idolaters, anything in front of God. All liars who lie consistently against the truth, their part will be suffering in hell. You see, I wanted to make that very clear to people. Maybe there's somebody watching. Maybe there's somebody in here that, that God is true to his word, that he is not going to let folks like that in unless they have come to him and trusted in him. It's not universalism. It's not annihilation. But he gives chance under the grace that he has to come to him 
and to trust in him and allow him to transform your life to get rid of all that. Yes, we've got the old man in us and that old man comes up sometime. We all can attest to that. But we have the Holy Spirit who is what? Greater in us. Right? Than in the world. The world can't touch us when we call upon Jesus. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. John says. You see... God's talking about in verse 8. He's talking, you know, where the tears and the suffering and all the groanings and agony is going to be? It's going to be in a lake of fire away from us. So you have a choice. God didn't send you there. Matthew writes that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels, never prepared for men. 2 Thessalonians 1, 9 through 10 says these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord, from the glory of his power. When he comes to be glorified in his saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who believe for our testimony to you was believed. We're going to marvel at him for all eternity. Worship him. Thank Him for the life that He's given us. Thank Him for everything that He's done for us. Thanking Him and praising Him. Not ourselves. Not other people. Him who is on the throne. Ray Stedman. In his book on Revelation, God's final word. Wrote this. It says, There's no disappointment in heaven. No weariness, sorrow, or pain. No hearts that are bleeding and broken. No songs with minor refrain. The clouds of our earthly horizon shall never appear in the sky. But all, who, uh, but all will be sunshine and gladness with never a sob nor a sigh. Folks, there's the hope in this time of suffering, in this time of chaos in which we live in. Why? Because we have a wonderful God who is faithful and true. A wonderful place where we will never be blue. A wonderful promise where all suffering will be slew. A wonderful place inside of his face. A wonderful place in the love of his grace. A wonderful place, this place called heaven. Where no pain or suffering will be allowed. A wonderful hope with no more tears. A wonderful future with no more fears. What a great poem. Finally heaven. The new heaven and the new earth. God will dwell among us. The first things pass away. Why should we believe it and what if we choose not to? It all talks about today in the culture in which we live in. God is such a good God. He don't shut anybody off until they choose with their final breath not to believe. Or he comes back to set it right. In our time of invitation today, here's, here's the challenge. If you don't know Christ, today is the day to do it. Don't wait until tomorrow. Don't wait until the next day. Today is the day. Come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior. Trust Him. Go to Him and tell Him you've tried everything that you can do in your own way, your own time, but it never has satisfied you. Come to him and say forgive me Lord I trust what you have done on the cross that you were buried and raised again I believe that I trust that thank you Lord for saving me that's all you have to do that's all you have to do today you can do that right where you're at if you do know him Christian have you thanked him for his love and his promise in your life are you, uh, is there any bitterness or anger or is there any anxiety or anything else that may be blocking that relationship with you because we've got a better place coming. we got a better place coming. Something in which we can't even imagine. What is it that may be straining your relationship today with Jesus Christ? Would you come or at least stand where you're at or wherever you might be there on social media? Would you just go to him and ask him, Lord, I'm so self-centered, so prideful. A lot of stuff in my heart and I have not thanked you today or in the past month or however long that you have a place for me eternally in your home. 
Would you do that today as Andrew and as Debbie come and they lead us in this time of invitation? You just do whatever the Lord may be leading you to do. Would all stand with me again and join with me in singing. into your house and just to worship you lord you are worthy of our worship and praise each and every day each and every minute of the day of our lives father my prayer is is that if there was one here who are listening uh, that did not trust you that to this week that you would continue to allow them to chew upon the message the challenge father for us who are christians who are believers I pray, Father, that each and every morning, not only would we think about heaven and our eternal home, but, Lord, that when we would get up and we would be in our silent time or our prayer time, that, Lord, we would crawl upon that altar and sacrifice ourselves to you. Not our will, but yours be done during that day. Lord, confess. Uh, transform our minds don't let us be conformed to this outside world but transform them allow the truth of your word to infiltrate our lives and our hearts so that lord when we go out and we talk to other people and we tell them why we stand upon the promises of you that lord they see that authentically in our lives that we're not just saying that but that we really do trust you and we grab a hold of those promises. And we apply them each and every day. Father, I thank you for each one that's here. Thank you for each one that have been watching. We just come before your throne, Lord. I know there's many burdens on people's hearts. There's many things that uh, we don't know, but you do. We come praying for those. We lift them up. We pray, Lord, comfort and healing. We pray, Father, for answered prayers. We pray for patience while you are answering prayers. Father, may we just tune everything else out and come to you. Father, may you flood our thoughts with the thoughts of heaven and for eternity and understanding what it's all about. And as we do that, Lord, then allow us to be that lighthouse as we go out in this dark world. Allow us to be that salt that flavors things in which people want to come and, and talk about. Makes them thirsty. So, Father, we just ask that you would just put your shield of favor around us. Your shield of protection over us. Lord, that you would smile upon us. And Father, may we just continue to think how blessed we are with a gracious God like yourself who gives us life and breath each and every day. Forgive us where we have failed you. And in that, Lord, we'll thank you. Thank you for your love and your mercy and your grace each and every day. 
for it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.